uh, I know a lot of people in this group growing up. Uh, I was homeschooled, and a number of uh, the young people in this class were my classmates in our homeschool groups mm -hmm. and societies and stuff like that. So that's kind of how I came to be involved with this group. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you all today about is seven worldview questions that we can use in order to evaluate worldviews in, I don't want to say a simple way, but in a straightforward manner. It allows us to methodolo methodologically understand how a worldview is structured. And so the premise I'm working on today is that, is that kind of small? Can you all see the text? Okay, okay. sounds good. So the premise is that people tend to say they believe things without really thinking things through. And it can be easy, especially if you're busy, to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Uh, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, but you might never really flesh out what that means in your life. And I think it's especially difficult in today's age when the culture is so deceptively uh, against some of the biblical things that, uh, so, some things that are biblical. And it can be really easy for Christians, especially Christians who don't necessarily have a strong foundation in what they believe, for them to maybe accept what these these cultural truths that are being taught by the culture. Um, and so there are a couple things that I want to take out of this study. The first is that we're going to present a basis that will allow Christians uh, and other people to basically analyze a worldview. And we're going to do that today from a primarily Christian view and just see how what the Bible speaks to different topics. Uh, regarding what a person believes. Um, but it also will allow us to um, develop a strong biblical worldview in ourselves for a more introspective look. We can also look outward and be able to see these cultural truths and say, is this biblical? Is this not biblical? And, uh, and be able to critically analyze those things uh, before we necessarily accept them outright. Uh, and then finally, uh, to be able to confront people on a more individual basis and to be able to approach someone starting from where they believe, and especially if we're having discussions about what we believe and our faith, and we're trying to maybe allow God to convince them to become Christians uh, and to accept the biblical framework, it would, it's useful for us to know where to begin with that and what they believe in order to... Uh, begin building that relationship and discussion. So these seven worldview questions, they're based from a guy named David Klein who put together uh, a curriculum uh, for our homeschools uh, that I know at least three of us in the room went through uh, in high school. And so it's based around his structures like that. There are other authors who have also put together lists of questions that you can ask in order to understand a worldview, but I'm going to be going based off of Dr. Klein's in the order he presents, uh, and which may not be the emphasis that I would pick, but we'll do it in his order. Okay, so what are the seven worldview questions? Actually, really quick, I'm gonna go over a little bit of housekeeping here. So we've got seven questions. We're going to try and talk about all of them. We've also got an hour. So, uh, so that said, I absolutely, absolutely love, would, I would love your interaction with all this. And if you have any questions or you disagree with me outright on something, yeah, let's have a debate. Uh, but I'm also going to be watching the clock. So let's, uh, yeah, just a bit of housekeeping for that. OK, the first question, what is the nature of God? Second question. What is the nature of the universe? What is the nature of mankind? What is the basis of ethics and morality? Why is there evil and suffering? What happens to a person after death? And what is the meaning of history? And so Dr. Quine argues that these seven questions, while they might not be super philosophical in nature, are enough to begin to understand where a person's coming from, where you're coming from and how to confront issues and hard topics uh, in the world. So let's get right into this. Oh, and one other thing is that 
I won't be able to go into great detail for all these, but in the coming weeks, we're going to spend some more time looking at specific belief systems, how they approach uh, some of these topics. Um, so my dad told me yesterday while we were talking about this, he's like, yeah, you're like building the bookshelf today. And then we're going to be filling in the books on that bookshelf in the upcoming weeks. So that said, we're not going to be able to go into a whole lot of detail, but uh, it should be enough to get us started. Okay, so what is the nature of God? So the way I'm doing this is for each question, I've listed it off into a number of sub-questions that you can ask in order to begin to sort of unwrap this question and how it applies to people's belief systems. So I'm going to go ahead and try and make this a bit more interactive. So when, I, when we look at the question, what is the nature of God, that's, there's a lot of meat in there. So what sort of questions would we ask in order to begin to sort of approach this overarching question for people? What is nature? What do you mean when you say, what is nature? Okay, good question. Uh, so the nature generally is sort of what is something like, right? Um, and maybe a bit of how do we know what something is like, right? Okay. Yeah, Tyler. Yeah, even like, is God good? Um, I think there are a number of people who may believe in a higher power but don't think that he's good or that he cares. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, is he personal? Is yeah. he personal? <clears throat> Does he care about me, personally? Yeah. I work with a lot of gals that believe in God, but they don't think he has anything to do, cares about them. Right. So, Thomas, when you say, is he personal, is that about what you mean? Yes. And to, to some extent, because, again, there's been, there's a lot of people who will think in terms of um, uh, a God who is a, a part of element. So I'm thinking Hindus would sit there and say it's a god, but it's not personal in the sense that it's relatable. Right. Another thing is how many gods are there? Is, is he the one god? Great question. Yeah, yeah exactly. They're all good questions. Is right. he eternal? Is he eternal? Yeah. Yeah, and so let's see. So these are the questions that I listed when I was going through this myself. Um, so the, the first question, yeah, is there a god? Right? Uh, I think that's a big one, right? And what do we mean by that? Is that just supernatural, right? Where is it just something that's above nature or science? Um, uh, or like as you've been talking about, uh, is there something bigger than that, more personal? Um, yeah, so does God exist? What is God like? And then go into detail. Like you said, is he personal? Are there multiple gods? Yeah, you guys, you guys, you guys, you guys, you guys are doing good today. Yeah, I should have brought candy, man. <laughs> yeah, is God powerful? Uh, is God imminent? Is he here? Is he yeah. sovereign, right? Um, how do we know God? Does God care? So, yeah, you, you guys did great. So the way I'm going to outline this is I'm going to spend a slide going over the biblical view. Basically, the way I have understood the scripture uh, about what God is. In this case, I'm pulling directly from what Scott did a couple weeks ago. Yeah, so this is the list. That, That's why they did so well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, you guys have been through this already. So these, this is a list of attributes that Scott came up with, or at least presented, uh, on, I guess, a couple weeks ago. So God is eternal, he's infinite, self-existent, self-sufficient, triune, he's spirit, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, omniscient, unchangeable, personal, and good. Uh, I think that's a pretty good list, uh, and I wouldn't add anything to that uh, except sort of going off of uh, what Francis Schaeffer said and Tyler brought up a couple weeks ago. God exists, and he has revealed himself to us. And I think those are, are really important, right? And he's revealed himself to us in nature and also through his scripture. And he's intending for us to have a personal relationship with him. And he's here, right? Um, yeah, so those are kind of uh, what I understand the Bible to be describing, uh, how I understand the Bible to be describing God. So uh, if we were to look at that from a non-biblical view, say, perchance from the view of Islam, how would we instead describe God? Is one. God is one. Okay. I think that's a, a big one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a big one. Right. Uh, he's not really imminent. Mm -hmm. He's not really personal. Right. 
So he doesn't those. care. Yeah, I, I think you guys hit on the big ones. So what I did is I went through that exact same list. Uh, and can you guys see the red on there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Whenever, whenever I put colors on a slide, I'm taking a gamble. <laughs> are you saying that these are things that, that are not in the Quran or that they just don't believe? Or both? I, 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 what I'm doing is I'm taking the biblical view and uh -huh. saying this is what we believe about God. Uh -huh. And this is where uh, Muslims might would disagree okay. about uh, what God is. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time looking into the source material from the Quran, but from my understanding of what I've read uh, about Islam, um, this is sort of what I believe. So, God is not triune. God is one. God is not personal, like we talked about. Uh, and it's interesting, um, for the last one, is God good? They would absolutely say yes. Um, but I don't think that's the same way we would define good. Yeah. So what's their what's the Muslim's view on grace? I, I I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. Uh, they, Tyler says. Yeah, uh, yeah they would uh, in the cons in the discussion of being saved, right? They would appeal to the mercy of God in a similar way that we would say, "Well, I'm saved by His mercy and His grace." But it's uh, there's no security there. It's just appealing to His mercy. Allah is forgiving. Um, but they cannot reconcile that with the justice of God. So uh, at the cross, we reconcile justice and mercy. But uh, Muslims really struggle with how is it that God should forgive me, though I'm undeserving? How can you give me mercy? And it's a, it's a mystery they appeal to until the day they die. They never know. So, Yeah, that's why I would, when you said mercy and grace, I would drop the word grace. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Legalistic. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, let's look at this from another perspective, from atheism. So how would an atheism uh, describe God? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. God is not. <laughs> yeah, so that's good. Uh, okay, I've got one more. What about humanism? Mm. So, exactly. I like how you switched it right on. Yeah, yeah. So based on that list we had before, what's different? Uh, basically, so how would a humanist describe man, humankind, <coughs> right? Man is basically good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, th I think it goes deeper than that, to be honest, but I might be overreaching here. Um, but I think a humanist, would, especially from like the early 1900s or something like that, would go ahead and say, yeah, if man wants to be, man can last forever. Uh, if man wants to, man go, can go wherever he wants. Uh, man has created technology in order to build themselves. Man can feed themselves. Uh, triune and spirit don't make much sense in this uh, system. But I, I think at the extreme humanistic view, uh, man is God. I always knew you were a romantic, so. Huh? I always knew you were yeah, romantic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like the unchangeable because I think they would say that we're evolved. They're, we, we're constantly evolving to, mm. we're evolving to, to a better yeah. state. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and yeah, man is good. Right? I think that's... that's a communist view, too. Yeah. Much. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, but the, the big idea is that man makes himself. Right, and man is good, and man can do whatever he wants to, and if we all just work hard enough, we can make the system as good as we want, mm -hmm. and everything will be peachy keen. Cool. Okay, so that's the first worldview question, and I mean, we could go through a lot of different belief <coughs> systems and approach how they view God. When I put these slides together, I basically picked a couple for each, uh, for each worldview question, a couple of belief systems that really get expressed well in that specific question. Um, so this is kind of what I saw for the nature of God. So the next question, what is the nature of the universe? So what sort of questions might we ask in order to begin to unwrap this topic? Did it evolve? Okay, that's a really good question. How old is the universe? <laughs> right? Is it orderly? Yeah, okay, that's a good one. And that's one I don't believe I put on you. That's a really good one. Is the universe ordered or is it chaos? Oh, bonus for Scott. Yeah, wow. that's right. Does I just wanted to keep that sticker. Or was it created? Well, that's good. I like that. It, does the universe create or was it created? And I think that's really good um, because from maybe a naturalistic perspective, 
people believed that the universe just was, right? Um, and that it is, it has created intelligence through some sort of natural means. I like that, that point. I was at Old Navy and they were selling a t-shirt that said the universe will provide. Oh. And I was like, oh wow. <laughs> I, I think we covered this, um, but like uh, eternal. It has infinite. always existed and it will it always exist. Is it infinite? Right. Yeah. How big is it? How big is it? That's a good question. Well, that's and that's really important because the Webb, the James Webb telescope, is supposed to now be able to see to the edge of the universe. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! <laughs> and yeah. Are we in the multiverse? I mean, Horton and the Who would say, you know, we might have a multiverse. Right, 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 right. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> my favorite. <laughs> 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 the theology from Doctor Seuss. Yeah. Yeah. I thought she was going with the uh, Marvel universe, but she went with uh, Doctor Seuss. That's awesome. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so questions like, where did everything come from? Uh, why does the universe exist? I like this question because it's not asking what. Science is always trying to answer what is this, what is this, what is this? And maybe from a more philosophical question, we care about the why. Why does the universe exist? Uh, I also ask, why is the world beautiful? That's interesting. What is our relationship to nature? Uh, where did life, people, and intelligence come from? What is our relationship to other things we would call living, like plants and animals? Uh, you called it. Is there a multiverse? Are there intelligent extraterrestrials? I think that's a really interesting question. Uh, and I think the Bible might address it, though it might be indirect. Um, OK, so I did want to go on a little rabbit trail here, because every time uh, we talked about this presentation, people always wanted me to talk a little bit about some of the science and stuff. And we'll go into a bit more detail about science and worldviews, I think, in four or five weeks or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we'll look at the schedule after today. <laughs> is, 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 uh, it, is it truly a rabbit trail if you have a slide for it? Just, just wondering. Well, I could have, <laughs> I could have put the slide in the appendix and then, yeah. You know, that was always in my mind that the slide would go in the appendix, but you know. Um, so I've got a couple quotes here, um, and we're just talking about these things called anthropic coincidences. So uh, this is from an author called Stephen Barr. Uh, he wrote a book called Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, which we actually studied for one of my undergrad classes, which is really cool. Uh, but he says, it has been found that many features of the laws of physics seem to coincide with what is required for the emergence of life to be possible. This is what is meant by the term anthropic coincidences. And I have those quotes myself because I don't think they're coincidences. And so in my mind, this speaks, is a huge evidence that God created the universe, right? Because the idea is there are so many things in the universe that are so fine-tuned for life to exist. This, is, this isn't even talking about evolution. This is just talking about where a planet is or some sort of atomic constants that are all coinciding at the exact right values in order for life to exist. And it is unreasonable for me to believe that that happened by chance. Um, now, Stephen Hawking has a very similar quote, and he says, the laws of science as we know them at present contain many fundamental numbers like the size of electric charge of an electron and the ratio of masses of proton and the electron. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. Which is really interesting, because that's Stephen Hawking, right? And he's a well-known atheist. And he goes on to explain how, basically, the scientific explanation for all these coincidences is very similar to a cop-out in my mind. And they basically say, look, we wouldn't be able, we wouldn't exist in a universe that didn't have all these coincidences. Therefore, these coincidences had to happen because we exist. That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, and I can understand where they're coming from, but I also think it's way more obvious to me that these things were created by a god. And I think these are much stronger evidence for the fact that a god exists, created the universe, and created life, intelligence, and all that stuff, as opposed to uh, just some mere coincidences uh, that had to exist because we observed them. So that's, that's kind of the, the idea here. I love the intelligent design theories because... Uh, God created us with the ability to contemplate him, to have this discussion and define who he is from our perspective and within our parameters. Right. And so I think that 
it totally nixes the case for, for chance. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's super cool. Um, and the hard part is when you're a scientist and you're coming at it from the perspective of God doesn't exist, how do you answer these questions, right? And uh, I feel like a lot of times we go down long rabbit trails just trying to come up with explanations for some of these these things we observe in the universe, which are pretty obviously more easily explained by the supernatural, which they're not willing to accept. Um, I think that's why there's also often falsification and just lies. Yeah. Scientists to explain things that they can't. Yeah, yeah. Cool, so that's that rabbit trail. Let's get back into uh, the biblical view of the nature of the universe. So what do we believe about the universe? It's Great. finite. Finite, okay, that's good. Spoken to existence. Spoken to existence. That God is apart from the creation. Okay, that's good. That's really good. God is not... The, He's not bound by it. Yeah, and the universe isn't divine either. But it's good. Right. <clears throat> or at least at one time it was right, good. Right. I mean, it's, yeah, there's, there's goodness. Yeah. yeah, there is goodness and beauty. Right. I guess that's right. Yeah. Right. But it is fallen. Right. It is fallen. Yes. The start of time, the creation of time, yeah. the essence of time. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time is part of the universe, right? And there is a beginning to it. Well, how you tell time, I guess, is what I mean. So as far as the universe is created, you know, the universe is created so that you could tell time. So you could mm. see a year, you could see a Oh, day, interesting. I like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So without the universe, you wouldn't have that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Cool. So yeah, let's go into the answers that I put down. Uh, God created the universe, everything in it, and actively sustains it. Uh, God created the universe for his pleasure uh, and also for our dominion. God endowed us with the ability to perceive and enjoy the creative masterpiece that is the universe. I basically said any psalm about worshiping God. <laughs> uh, nature is intended for us and it's meant to sustain us and likewise we are supposed to work it and be good stewards of creation. Uh, God designed the intricacies of life and intelligence. Uh, we are likewise above the animals and plants, uh, and they are part of nature. They were created for us. Uh, and yeah, so here's my argument that there's no multiverse or aliens. So from a multiverse perspective, from a Marvel multiverse perspective, there are multiple copies of me running around, right? And That's scary. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. Well, I'm thinking about you, Scott. <laughs> But super villain, Scott. from my perspective, when they talk about the multiverse, they're like, yeah, all these things are happening, right? And it seems to me that if that existed, then there would likely be a saved version of me and an unsaved version of me uh, in this multiverse. I don't know if that's a correct logical step, but that's kind of how I'm thinking of it. Uh, and in that case, that doesn't make sense, because in Revelation 20, you're either saved or you're not saved. Your name's either in the Book of Life or it's not in the Book of Life. And it doesn't make sense to me that those don't coincide for me. But another thing that just occurred to me is that it's not self-sustaining, that God sustains the universe. Right. Yeah. And that, that's one thing. He upholds it. He holds it all together. So. Yeah, I think that's true. And yeah, that's one thing I didn't put in here that I wish I did, is that the universe is not divine. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a, a really good way to sum that up. Um, and then from an alien's perspective, um, Christ died once for all, and I don't think we, the reason we're fallen is because our great ancestor Adam and and his wife Eve sinned, right? And would that curse apply to extraterrestrials, right? All that stuff, and especially I mean intelligent extraterrestrials, right? And did Christ die for them? And all questions like that. And the Bible clearly says Christ died once for all, uh, and so I don't believe that they would apply. I also think culturally our concept of aliens um, is that they're intelligent and incredibly powerful, mm. you know, uh, sort of demigods, and yet um, humans are the crowning work of creation. So even if on some faraway planet there was some microbe, <laughs> right. you could call that an alien, uh, but, but nothing will ever amount to 
uh, human beings as God has made us in the image of God. So, yeah, that's another great point. Yeah, there was years and years ago there was in the Jesus movement a singer, and I can't remember his name, but he had a song about that if there was life on other planets, that Jesus had been there and died for them too. And I just always thought that was so wild. <laughs> Where did you pull that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, our Mormon people, sources. Yeah, our Mormons were here. They'd say they pulled it from Mormon theology. Yeah. 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 I think too we need to look at the creation as a whole. He created it all for us to reign over. I think that's a really and good point. And so, you know, we're we're stuck here because of the curse. Uh, but it, when he brings us back to life, how much volume that will be mm -hmm. on this small landmass. So I think that he has structured the entire universe to support us for us to steward, not just this one planet. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, talk about the aliens. Um, this reminds me of a, a quote I heard uh, from Carl Sagan, one of people put so much importance in the, the poor guy. Uh, he once said that uh, if the aliens, if an alien came down to Earth, mm -hmm. it, it, it would save us. You know, it, it, we see the demonic nature there of people putting their faith in uh, mm -hmm. aliens instead of, you know, Satan just drawing them away from the truth, which is Christ. And, uh, I felt sorry for that poor guy. Yeah. And the History Channel cannot imagine how there could be pyramids without aliens. Yeah, exactly. But then they reject the creation of the universe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's another good good point, is that people sometimes go to aliens before they go to God, yeah. right? It's really interesting. Okay, um, so let's look at this question from another perspective. So what would a naturalist believe about the nature of the universe? Does the universe have a beginning? It does. The Big Bang. Yeah. Hmm. Although there are many in the big, like, astro, like, the cosmology world where they're trying everything they can to make an eternal beginning. Yeah. Uh, by bending, using quantum theory to try and say that the universe had no beginnings. I've seen one approach that tries to say, yeah, the Big Bang just keeps happening over yeah. and over and over again. And every time it's another shot at life, right? And the Big Bang, Big Crunch. Yeah, I don't know. Again, it's just way out there for me, and it's much easier for me to believe that there was a personal creator God in charge of everything. Right? Yeah, that's where it gets into the other things, too. Is it flat? Is it open? Yeah. You know, these cosmological mm -hmm. things. Are really right. Interesting. right, right, right. Yeah, is there an edge to the universe? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so the universe is a freak cosmic accident. So this is looking at the question of why, right? Why does the universe exist? And and I feel say, yeah, no reason. <laughs> it just happened. Uh, universe is devoid of purpose. Mm -hmm. Beauty is an illusion, a side effect of evolutionary natural selection. We are evolutionarily fine-tuned in order to appreciate beauty. And, I mean, beautiful things tend to be good food, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so, yeah, this is an interesting... Mm -hmm. Naturalism kind of goes in two directions when it comes to where the rubber beats the road. Some people believe humans are part of nature, right? And maybe the pinnacle of nature. Other people believe that we are terrorists on nature, right? That the fact that people exist is the worst thing that ever happened to the world. Yeah, I heard somebody describe us, we're yeast. The closest thing that they can find us to is yeast. Yeast. Uh, that would run, what runs through its environment, eating everything and then dying in its own air. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah, on that note. That's, that's, I think that perfectly encapsulates that for yeah, you. Yeah, I think you're right. And when, yeah, when you're in a naturalistic framework, there's no purpose. There's right? no purpose. And it does lead to a nihilistic point of view, exactly. right? And uh, I, I feel sad for anyone who is a true nihilist, because that is a very sad place to be. We're in the of it. Life, humanity, and intelligence are natural, and are products of evolution uh, occurring over a very long time span. Uh, we have no reason to claim dominion over the animals, except that we're smarter than they are, and stronger. That's still a good reason. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good reason. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like evolution. But it's not some sort of uh, divine, divinely appointed right. Okay, uh, from a mysticism perspective, and this is broad because there are so many different types of mysticism and stuff like that, but from a very broad perspective, um, what are some ways that a mystic, especially in some sort of Eastern philosophy, how they might answer this question? The universe doesn't exist. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> the universe doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. 
that there's that the, the physical it's you go to Gnosticism it's the, the spiritual it's more important than the physical mm -hmm. the, the physical is evil the spiritual is good mm -hmm. you get those kinds of discussions it's, right the universe is divine is by definition mm -hmm. divine. yeah I, I, I think, think that's or, a really good or animals uh, or that we are equal to the animals right yeah, yeah everything has the spark of divine right 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 that think, God lives through man therefore man is God that's interesting that's great. right yeah. Yeah, so the universe is defined, divine, self-sustaining. The universe, therefore, has some meaning, uh, though that might not be clear what that is. Um, we can become one with nature, call it God, we could call it nature, through meditation and abandonment of our human distortions. So that's kind of what you were saying, uh, where, yeah, uh, it's kind of like a Gnosticism type of uh, thing. Uh, animals might contain the souls of reincarnated humans. All right. Uh, and thus, life is sacred. All life is sacred. So that is, it's an interesting way to, to answer this question, right? It's a, the same question, but we're <laughs> answering it from these different points of view uh, and seeing how that kind of informs how a person would view the world and how a person would act in the world. All right, well, let's move forward. So what is the nature of mankind? So Scott already... Sinners. Um, yeah, we're sinners, right? Um, so I'll go ahead and speed through this one a bit more. Uh, but what are we? I think that's a really good question, right? Uh, why do we exist? Again, that why question. Do I own my body? I think this is a really interesting question and it's really applicable today. Do we have a soul? What does that mean? What is our relationship with God, with the divine? What is our relationship with nature? What is our relationship with other people? Does behavior spring for, from something spiritual, or is it a product of the environment, right? Uh, and this could go to as deep as we're all just mechanical, biological uh, interactions happening in the brain, right? And that's why we do things, right? Or it could be something we're spiritual, um, or even though we're spiritual, our environment still speaks to our uh, behavior more than we do. <laughs> And finally, are people naturally good or bad? <coughs> okay, yeah, so thank you, Scott, for outlining this previously. So we are individuals created by God in his image. We are created with free will to have a harmonious relationship with the creator. God has given us our bodies to use and to be good stewards of. It's more than just a home to us. It's also a home to the Holy Spirit, uh, also a home to unborn children. Uh, and I think that's biblical. Um, and... We should be, I think the church should be, a, well, we're already pretty strong on, uh, on these topics, but I think it's really good for us to be solid in what we believe uh, about our bodies because the world keeps telling us, you are you, your body is your own, you can do whatever you want. And I don't think that's biblical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've included the verse there in First Corinthians <clears throat> 6, but it, it's specifically talking about the Christian, but it does say, um, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And the concept of bodily autonomy is utterly foreign to Christianity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, humans are spiritual beings, and they have a soul, uh, and they can know God. Uh, I think that's that's really interesting, right? Um, to the point where uh, some of these references uh, basically say, in order to worship God, you have to worship Him in spirit. Um, I think that's really interesting. Uh, we are uh, in dominion of nature, and we should be good stewards of it. Uh, we should strive for justice. This one's really interesting, right? Because some Christians say, hey, we shouldn't maybe intervene with the world system, right? And I don't think that's biblical either. Um, especially from these verses here, they're all like, strive for justice, strive for justice. The one who loves justice uh, is, is good, right? And so justice is a huge theme in the Bible. Um, but I also think mercy is also a huge theme in the Bible, right? And what does that look like, right? And so the way that I've come to understand it is that, at least for me personally, is that justice should be administered impartially um, by a group of people which we have established as being uh, an authority over other people. Um, yet from a personal perspective, I should hold myself to a higher standard, uh, but also administer mercy. 
uh, to people on an individual standard. That's kind of the way I understand that, and I think people really disagree on that. Uh, finally, people can choose to act how they will. The desires of the flesh are most often in opposition to what is good. And that's kind of where Scott left off uh, last time we met. Okay, so how does a human, a humanist, approach this question? We're innocent. We're born innocent. We're good. We're good. We're good. <clears throat> yeah. We're not fallen. I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I think. Like I said, I'm approaching this from a 1930s perspective, right? Where <coughs> everybody's very optimistic about the human, <laughs> the human <Yeah>. state. <laughs> uh, but humans are the pin pinnacle of the world, right? And uh, like we talked about in the first question, they're the closest thing to the divine that exists. Um, humans have immense power to control their environment, uh, and they can do whatever they set their minds to. Uh, humans can dictate nature to their whim, Humans can achieve world peace with increasingly advanced communication technology. But the reason that we haven't had peace so far is because we haven't been talking to each other, nor have we had the ability to communicate effectively. That's it. Yeah. Uh, and people have made catastrophic choices in the past, but yeah, this was due to a lack of resources. And ultimately, people will be able to pull themselves out of the mess that we made for ourselves and uh, everyone will benefit. Didn't God diffuse the communication uh, technology theory back at Babel? <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> that's a really good point. Yeah, that's a really good point. Okay, so now I've got a little topic on what I'm calling wokeism. What do you guys think that I mean by this? <laughs> the group identity. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not an individual with an individual purpose, but I only exist at the intersection of my different characters. Yeah. You know, th that's really interesting because I think both sides are really emphasized, right? Not only, I mean, yes, we're a part of a group community, but also, uh, and maybe for a very specific community, that the needs of those people in that specific community should be emphasized over others, right? And it's a really interesting viewpoint. I think there are a lot of problems with it. Um, but yeah, let's pull these on the screen uh, so could we can we talk call, to them. Could we call wokeism like wokeism slash bullyism? Yeah, yeah. I, I think for, for man, man's not created by God, which has always been the case for a lot of people, but not by uh, evolution either. Man's created by himself, irregardless of what the naturalistic mm -hmm. Worldly sense out there, that mm. you're part of into something, or truly, truly, it is about man, and it's about creating yourself how you want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So humans have full right to do whatever they want to their body. So I think that's a big tenet. Um, humans should be treated like their soul or themselves, themselves, whatever, is the most sacred thing in the world. And improper behavior comes from denying another person what they believe they should have. Um, and then there, there are different, different uh, flavors of wokeism too, I think. Um, and so this is talking more about what Tyler is talking about. Uh, people who have less or share characteristics with people who have had less historically have a higher right to assert themselves over others. Um, and thus justice should be partial to the minority groups and the oppressed groups regardless of whether or not that's, that's fair. I think how we define sin is also very different. You know, I'm not responsible in a lot of ways because uh, it's nature versus nurture. I guess it goes back to that question. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. There's no personal responsibility. It's right. about the collective. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so question. What is the basis of ethics and morality? So this question is primarily motivated by, like you're talking about, what is sin, right? Is there a good and a bad? And I think a lot of people, while they might not be able to describe it, would definitely tell you there, there's good and bad in the world. Um, but they might not necessarily have a basis for what that means. Um, and I think if you take like a naturalistic perspective to its logical conclusions, there's no basis for ethics and morality, right? We're evolutionary beings. We got where we are because we killed people and other animals that were weaker than us. 
right? That's, from a naturalistic perspective, what is good, right? Uh, we've evolved to some state that is way better than anything because of depth and, and survival. Um, and so, but I think most people in the world would disagree with that conclusion uh, because clearly things are good and bad, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's pretty obvious. Um, so, some of these questions. Uh, is there an absolute basis for ethics and morality? Does this apply to everyone uh, in all circumstances? Uh, questions like that. Uh, is morality based on circumstances? Should people judge each other according to their actions? Are there different types of morality for different people? Uh, so from a biblical perspective, yes, there is an absolute basis of ethics and morality that is based primarily on the character of God. Um, there are clear sins which are listed in the Bible, and I pulled these specifically from the New Testament uh, because there are some who would, uh, I mean, we're not bound by the law anymore, yeah. right? Um, but clearly, there are still things which are bad, and the, I mean, the list is really long in the New Testament, <laughs> right? Uh, sexual immorality, right? Anger, malice, deceit, right? They just go through uh, a lot of things that are clearly wrong, still wrong for us. Uh, likewise, all have sinned. And I think to make such a strong claim like that in Romans 3, it, it, it means to me that there is some really strong basis for ethics and morality, right? Because if all have sinned, in order to make a universal statement like that, there must be uh, a basis by which all are accountable. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my view on that. Now, it gets complicated, because uh, moral gray areas are biblical. Um, and we talk about sort of the idea of food sacrifice to idols uh, and stuff like that, which is covered in 1 Corinthians 8, uh, a similar issue in Romans 14, right? <laughs> this is not moral relativism, um, because I believe morality is still based on God's character, and whatever is not done in faith is sinful, uh, as Paul clearly lays out in these passages. Um, so even though, for some, sacrificing food to idols is a sin. And for others who might be spiritually stronger, uh, sacrificing food to idols is not a sin. It's, it's nothing. <laughs> it's just something. And it's just something you do, right? It's like eating food. Not good, not bad. Um, but I think the, the thing is, it, whatever you do should be done in faith. Um, and if you find yourself acting and you're hiding from God, uh, or what you're doing is not uh, in faith, then you need to be seriously questioning whether or not you're sinning. <laughs> um, but even still, I think no matter what, this is still an absolute basis for ethics and morality, uh, based entirely on God's character and our standing with God. Uh, the government can and should judge people according to their actions to administer justice. Christians should also love those who do evil. Uh, it's kind of a, a dichotomy. Um, but I think this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, where I believe that the government should be an impartial administrator of justice, and then we as Christians should, on an individual basis, love our neighbors and love those who persecute us. Uh, and finally, Christians have the right and should uh, approach and confront Christians who have sinned. Yeah, I think I really love this dichotomy that you're bringing up, which is that we should love those who do evil, but we should recognize and confront the sin of believers. Mm. Uh, and the perception of non-Christians, that how non-Christians perceive the church is that we do the opposite. Right. Is that we don't hold one another accountable, but we're judging the world. Uh, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, which you have up there, um, says, I don't, I don't judge those on the outside. It's right. those within the body that I judge. And so uh, I think that's a really important points to bring to light. So. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, from a humanistic perspective, uh, and I'm kind of grouping together the humanism and the wokeism a bit into this, uh, but we already talked about some of this, right? Um, there's no absolute basis for ethics and morality. Um, <coughs> ethics should be based on the human collective will, whatever mm. that means in the current generation. Oh, yeah. Something is wrong when it impedes another person from expressing their will. So this is uh, going back to like the 1700s or something like that, um, the Enlightenment era type things. And I think the phrase life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is a very humanistic phrase. 
Um, and it kind of defines morality for uh, sort of late 1700s, uh, early 1800s, uh, especially in the West, right? And basically that every person has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness uh, and violations of that. If you uh, violate that for someone else, um, then that's immoral. That's the basis of ethics and morality. Uh, and that's what should be punished by the government, right? So the government is in charge of making sure that everybody has a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, uh, moral relativism. <clears throat> so there is no basis for eth ethics and morality. Ethics should be based on the individual human will, and ethics are primarily circumstantial. Uh, actions are good if they have a good outcome, right? Um, and even if the action itself is somewhat questionable, if it has a good outcome, if it's for the greater good, then yeah, it's good. Uh, and then everybody should be true to themselves and to do what they believe is right. So, and ran. Huh? And ran. Yeah. Well, I think too, one thing Tyler mentioned, well, however many months ago it was when he was up, but this idea to sit there and say, we are in a state now where your uh, actions do not have to be good as long as your thoughts are correct. Mm. <clears throat> if you express a particular mm. statement, mm. it's carte blanche to act however you want to. Interesting, interesting. Whereas in the past, it was always the opposite. Right, it's what you do that matters. It's what you did that mattered, yeah. and you have liberty of conscience. Interesting. <clears throat> we see society trying to define a new ethical uh, basis and they're struggling because it's not consistent and it's impossible to do it consistently right. so you see that you know good is bad and bad is good kind of thing that's going on now yeah exactly okay uh, and then people should not judge each other according to their actions <laughs> which yeah I put that that in itself is a moral claim but should not the yeah. phrase should not is saying this is that's moral, right? And so I think that's pretty pretty interesting, right? So if you judge somebody according to their actions, then you're going to get judged according to your judging of them. That doesn't quite sound right. Um, okay, question number five: Why is there evil and suffering in the world? Because there's people. Because there's people. Hey, that's a good answer. Yeah. So the best way this is phrased, or the most common way this is phrased in the current society, is why do good or bad things happen to good people? Uh, I think this is the way the question has been asked by a lot of people throughout mm -hmm. the generations. Why do people die? That's a good question. Uh, if there's a God, why does he allow suffering? I think that's a really big turnoff for people to Christianity. Why do natural disasters happen? Um, okay, so yeah, from the biblical worldview, evil is a result of sin. Uh, the world is cursed because of the fall. All people sin. And this has, sin has bad consequences, right? Uh, and death itself is a direct consequence of sin, and we are all under that, uh, that punishment. Um, but at the same time, God is sovereign, and he uses suffering for his will, though we might not know what that looks like uh, at the time, right? Um, so suffering, first of all, is a temporary thing, especially compared to eternity. Um, suffering can bring people closer to God. That's biblical. Suffering can be used to bring people closer to each other. Uh, we see examples of people comforting each other when they're suffering. Uh, and likewise, suffering is used to bring glory to God. Uh, I referenced the book of Job here. Uh, nothing specific. <laughs> um, but, but, <laughs> but also the ten plagues uh, in Exodus, right? Uh, that is clearly suffering that was inflicted by God. Uh, that ultimately brought him glory. Uh, I, I think that's uh, a really interesting uh, look at the, the nature of God uh, and how suffering is kind of used in the world. Um, Pain tells you something is wrong. Yeah. yeah. It's, self it's like, protecting. right, right, right. It's like the, the birth pains, right? Or, that we're just waiting for yeah. something better. Well, if you think about leprosy, for instance you're losing the ability to feel right. pain, and so you nub your hands down to nothing or whatever, or you put your hand on a stove yeah. and don't know it's burning. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, you know, when something hurts, it isn't right, it allows you to self-correct, <coughs> and 
do what is right. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a that's a fair point too. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not as though just with the the ten plagues in particular, it's not as though God just said, um, "I'd really like some glory right now, so I'm going to cause some suffering." You know, it was a uh, it was an act of judgment on a on a corrupt mm. and unrighteous mm. people, and an act of mercy on His covenant people at the same time. So. Uh, it did bring about his glory, and that was one of the purposes, but it wasn't random. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a really good point. I, I was going to sit there and say, too, I think one of the things that's missing, possibly, that we have a hard time with, is, is, but it's important to understand that suffering is not done in isolation. Yeah. It's, I mean, our, our Lord suffered in the same way that we suffered. Mm, mm. That's a good point. That's a really good point. And we define suffering. Um, Jesus said it's not to be compared to the glory, you know, this little tumult that we're in. So we've got a, a perception of suffering that is a lot different. And, and I think in trying to convey that or reconcile it back with Christ, glory is, is the job to be done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Okay, um, so naturalism. Bad things happen to good and bad people. There's no cause, but it's random. Bad things happen to all people. And questions about why are really interesting in naturalism, because they all have the same answer. There's no reason. Um, so it doesn't even make sense to ask a question, why am I suffering in a world that has no meaning? Right. And I, I think this is interesting because there are a lot of his, uh, historical examples of people who have left the faith because they had suffering. Uh, and I think for them, it was just easier for them to believe that the universe had no meaning, that there was no reason that they were suffering, as opposed to believe that God was allowing them to suffer. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, what happens to a person after death? And I think this, the questions, sub-questions for this one are all, does this happen, does this happen, does this happen, right? So instead, I've just outlined it as, what do we believe, what do other people believe? Um, so the biblical view. People are judged according to whether or not they're covered by the blood of Christ. If they are, they spend eternal, uh, eternal, eternity in the glory of God. If not, they spend eternity in the absence of God's glory in hell. Uh, I think that's very biblical. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, there, there are some people who pervert this view. Um, Christians um, who, uh, yeah, try to apply different things. So biblical view, not the biblical view. Uh, cessation of existence. Um, there is no soul is one way to interpret this, right? When we die, nothing happens. Um, or unsaved souls stop existing after judgment. I don't think that's biblical. Some of you might disagree with me, uh, and we could have a talk about that at lunchtime or something like that. Um, reincarnation. Souls are reborn into the earth after death. Uh, this has had a lot of different flavors throughout history. Uh, it's Greek and Eastern, I think. Uh, both have roots in this. Uh, universalism. All souls will be saved eventually, even if that might take some time for the unsaved souls, uh, and no matter what their salvation status is on earth. There are a lot of more liberal Christians who are trying to push universalism because they just can't understand how God would allow uh, a soul to be eternally damned. It goes back to Bart. Carl Bart, Carl Bart was big and yeah. Interesting, okay. Purgatory, saved souls, yeah, they're saved, but they still need to work off all their sins before entering into God's right. glory. This is a Catholic view. Limbo, uh, I'm pulling this from Dante now. Uh, unsaved souls, if they were good enough, they don't go into term torment. They just kind of exist in some sort of lukewarm existence. It's neither good or bad. Uh, and then divinity. We become God or we become other gods and rule planets or something like that. Um, there are, uh, I think, people who say they're a Christian who believe this view too. Okay, the final question. We're a little bit over, but we'll wrap this up pretty quickly. So the question, what is the meaning of history? I think this one is really important today. Really, really important today. So the questions are, here, I'll just list them. I'm not sure why I'm thinking. 
<laughs> okay, so the question is like, does history matter? Why do we remember the past? Um, should we study the actions of our predecessors? And how do those actions impact us today? Is history true? I think that's a really good question. Um, is history going somewhere? Okay, so the biblical view. I think history is important for several reasons expressed in the Bible. Uh, first of all, we can look through history, we can remember what God has done, and even if we couldn't see his purpose in the past, we might be able to see that now. Uh, and we can glorify him. Uh, and we know that he's going to be faithful in the future because he's been faithful in the past. Uh -huh. uh, we should also study the actions of our predecessors to gain wisdom and to avoid mistakes. Uh, I think that's a view that's accepted by most people uh, about history. Uh, history is truth. So what is mm. truth, right? Um, and our memory of history might be inaccurate, uh, but we should strive for truth uh, because God is a God of truth, right? And when we approach history, we should be looking at it from a perspective of what, it, what happened, what actually happened, why did it happen, what can we learn from it? as opposed to, uh, yeah, this, these events kind of happened, and this is the lesson we can frame it as, right? Um, the winners write the history book. Yeah, exactly. So what is truth is the pursuit, because what really happened may not be what they wrote down. Yeah, exactly, right, and a lot of people lie, right? And I, I think as Christians, we should be critically examining Every, everything that we're taught about history and really trying to analyze whether or not that's true. That's really important now because the whole CRT thing and all that is all based on narrative. Yes. It is not history. I, 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 it's I a story agree. made up out of whole cloth. Right. Well, and even recent history, things that some people today can still remember, mm -hmm. like the Holocaust, they're already trying to change. And that's, you know, right. that far away. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, and so finally, history is the ultimate story of the world, right? Every, every part of the Bible uh, and from our history, we're seeing God weave this giant story through history, uh, from creation to the fall of mankind, to the establishment of the law, uh, salvation, uh, to the church, the second coming. Uh, basically, all of history is just this kind of woven story uh, that God is writing, culminating in the second coming, uh, the events listed in Revelation. Uh, essentially, history has a beginning, and it's moving somewhere, and that story is dictated by God. Uh, and I think it's, there are a lot of people who don't believe that. Okay, so I got a couple, subs oh yeah, sorry, Tyler. I just wanted to recommend a book real quick on history. It's a very short book, you could read it in about a weekend. It's called The Bible Among the Myths okay. by a guy named Oswald. Um, I'll just throw that out there, Bible Among the Myths, really good, brief treatment of history. Uh, from a biblical perspective. Awesome. So. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So I came up with this term, reformation is <laughs> I can't even pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Anyway, so it's like Scott was saying. Um, history is a tool. Primarily, it's a tool that is used for teaching modern cultural truths. And that is defined by the current culture and gets to speak about what happened previously based on what we're trying to emphasize now. Uh, our memory of the past is largely imperfect, and who is to say if our interpretation of history is correct or incorrect? History should be reframed to teach the current generation about how we understand morality today as a giant overarching culture. Mm -hmm. History, yeah, it's true in that it teaches cultural truths, um, though its accuracy and historical accuracy might be questionable. <laughs> Uh, it was really interesting, and this is, it's got a lot of wokeness in it, a lot of postmodernism in it, uh, and like Scott said, it's more about the narrative than what is actually true. Uh, and then finally, history is a sequence of events, uh, it's not really that useful, it has no overarching structure beyond that defined by the culture today. Okay, finally, mysticism. Um, History is useful for wisdom, though we don't really care about the actual things that happened. Uh, and second of all, history is cyclic, with the same things happening over and over and over again, though the details are largely different. Um, 
And yeah, a lot of time in these mysticism type ideas, I, the ideas are expressed extremely generally without a lot of detail. Uh, so I think that this is how uh, someone who ascribes this to a mystical view would probably approach this question. Okay, so let's summarize. So like I said, I built the bookshelf and we've looked at these seven worldview questions uh, at a very high level. Uh, and we've talked about briefly how they can be used to be applied to uh, a number of different worldviews uh, and how we be can begin to approach uh, analyzing worldviews based off of these views. And we're gonna go into more detail in the future weeks uh, about how this looks for modern worldviews uh, along with how we can see worldviews expressed in art, literature, science, stuff like that. And that's kind of the direction for uh, the first several months of this year. Um, okay, yeah, so this framework gives a starting point for analyzing worldviews of the world and of ourselves. And likewise, answering broad, these broad questions in detail can also help to strengthen our faith. Yeah. And that's where I conclude today. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, Alex.